right, well, welcome everybody to this virtual career fair. I am Amy Stainhook and I work at DMAC. We're excited to have you join the finance session today. And I have Tom Swartwood on the line with us. Excited to get to know Tom a little bit and hear about his background as it, um, as it relates to the finance industry and hear, hear about his story. So Tom, I'm gonna toss it over to you, take it away. Great, thanks Amy, and, and thank you everybody for uh, joining in. I think this is a terrific opportunity. Amy and I were sharing some of our Zoom adventures, but I have found Zoom to be an amazing tool in this crazy environment. And I, I'm telling my students and my friends, and I advise a lot of entrepreneurs uh, to stop thinking about going back to normal, that this is the new normal and embrace it. And I will just share with you briefly why I think that's valuable. Yesterday, uh, I was invited to a One Million Cups uh, uh, meetup. And One Million Cups is a great uh, networking and uh, kind of introduction meetup that occurs most weekly somewhere in the country. But we have a, a, a One Million Cups chapter that's going to start back up later in the month. And there's a very robust one in Des Moines. Des Moines had one of the first five One Million Cups in the country, became one of the largest and fastest growing. And in the typical model, One Million Cups, an entrepreneur or a small business person will arrive and talk about their business. And they're they're not pitching, they're not selling anything, they're not, they're not raising money, they are introducing their business and often asking for some help. It is one of the most collaborative, friendly business environments I've ever experienced. Young people are welcome. Uh, they communicate their schedules on Facebook. So you can go on the Facebook and it's, an, uh, look for, I'll just type it in. You can look for One Million Cups Ames or Des Moines, and I'm a terrible typist, so forgive. But um, the reason I mention it is I was on my way in yesterday, and a friend of mine had, who's one of the organizers nationwide, said, Hey, you got to get caught up. And so I, I dialed in, in my car. I was listening, I was on Zoom in my car. I did not have the video on, I was not zooming in the steering wheel, guys. Please don't do that. Um, but it wasn't until I joined the meeting that I realized it was taking place in Ocala, Florida. Nobody knows where Ocala is. Um, it's in North Central Florida. It's not a beach town. Uh, it's, it's literally two hours from the beach in either direction, but it happens to be a place where my wife has been visiting for the last five or six years because it is a, has a really burgeoning horse community with uh, a, a nationally recognized horse show that runs from January to March. And last year, she spent three months down there and about a month ago, we bought a second home down there. And here's all these people with this entrepreneurial community that I didn't even know existed because Ocala is some, I mean, it's a lot smaller than Des Moines. It's probably, maybe it's a Waterloo size and it, and it kind of had some industry and all this, but it never dawned on me that they would have that type of networking thing. And Zoom made that available. And networking is something I want to talk about that is critical to building a career in the finance world anyway. But I, I speak, I mentioned that because of the new normal. When I got to school uh, and I was getting ready for class, an email popped up that caught my eye because it had a ray line talking about a summer experience I had in high school. And in high school, I was fortunate enough to do a foreign travel program and I attended archeology span camps in Italy. I mean, I knew nothing about archeology. span I didn't apply for archeology. span I just wanted something out of the ordinary. And uh, this uh, American Field Service travel group hooked me up with this archeology span camp. I had stayed in touch with a couple of people that I met on the trip, but they weren't in my cohort. Well, this fellow is actually now a professor of archaeology at the University of Pennsylvania, and he, he tracked down two other folks that uh, were, were participants in that, and we're going to have a reunion after decades. I won't say how long ago, but I'm old enough to be everybody, including Amy's, maybe not her grandfather, but certainly her father. So anyway, um, I mentioned that because this is a small world. These, these folks that we're, I'm gonna connect with are all over the place. Back in the heyday, I met them, you know, as a high school junior flying to Italy, spent the summer with them. Uh, none of us speaking Italian. I mean, it's just those kind of opportunities abound. And 
those those experiences, the ability and, and having a background where I got to travel and I got, I, I got exposed to unique uh, settings, a unique pastime. I didn't know anything about archaeology. Uh, I'd never been to Italy. I didn't speak Italian. I spoke a little bit. I learned a lot about archaeology. Those became very helpful when I would introduce myself to people later, years later in the job search because I had this well-rounded, solid background. And I was pretty good at a couple of things. I wasn't great at anything, but I was pretty good at a couple of things. So I mentioned that. I really encourage everybody on here, particularly the young people, to take advantage of opportunities to build your network, to build these connections. Now, as I said, uh, I lost track of my camp cohort, but I, I t still am in touch with one of the people I met who is in the same program, but not in camps. She was doing a family stay. And then I met another American uh, woman who was visiting, whose, whose father was in the uh, ambassadorial corps, and we became friends for you know decades. We, we just kind of lost part, lost track as we moved across the country. But those connections are critical to building any career. And weirdly, even being in central Iowa, and I see we have folks from you know Nevada, Ames. Uh, looks like that's most of the the distribution. Um, People at Iowa State are connected all over the world. I mean, I came to, now I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I was raised in New Jersey and it, it will connect back to this. And it always connects back, believe it or not, it will always connect back. You may saying, what the heck is he talking about? But anyway. Um, yep, tell us who you are and what, what you do and connect us so, back there. I am, uh, my name's, his, his name said Tom Swartwood. I currently am, uh, I'm the first fellow in the Papa John Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, Papa John is not the pizza guy. He's a very successful venture capitalist. I can talk briefly about what that is. He set up five entrepreneurship centers in the state. I worked uh, at Drake for 10 years, helped build that program. Came up here a couple years ago to work with a great team. It's big. Iowa State is big. It's got uh, tentacles all over the state. And I teach in the business school. Uh, and I guess lecture in the computer science and uh, consumer science, which is retail programs. Um, I came to Des Moines in 1994 uh, after spending 12 years in New York City, where I worked in as a lawyer and in the investment banking business. I was raised in New Jersey. I went to public high school, uh, did a little bit of everything. It was a small school like many schools in Iowa, so you could show up and get on teams and get in programs, and I encourage you to do that. Um, I went to Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, and I was a history major. To this day, my dad scratched, and he's still around. He scratches his head. What the heck are you going to do with that? I just really liked it. I had great teachers. Um, no interest in a career in history. I mean, you know, short of being a professor, there aren't careers in history. But it was a great foundation for appreciating uh, what was going on in the culture and the con interconnection of society and culture, which played into my investment banking career. But I got admitted to Georgetown Law School. Uh, I took a year off between college and law school, worked in a coal mining business. My, uh, my summer job when I was in college, I worked at a, a deep coal mine in Harlan, Kentucky. Uh, they didn't really allow me to go underground because it was dangerous, but I got to pick up stuff, dig holes, fill up holes, paint stuff. Uh, it was a cultural adventure. I was also fortunate when I was in college, I traveled to France twice, first as a student, then I went back as a French language instructor. And my part-time job when I was in college is I ran French language drill courses. So I've, I've got this background in American history. I crammed a whole bunch of French in totally unexpectedly, never planned on it. I went to Dartmouth because it was a computer center, took one computer course and realized I wasn't smart enough to do that. And got admitted to law school, wanted a year off, went back, coal mine got sold, I got laid off. Went back to New York and I ended up working for one of the uh, leading investment bankers in New York City at the time, just to a family connection. Uh, and I was an intern, spent three or four months just making copies, doing basic research, schlepping stuff. Uh, but it gave me some insight into raising money for innovative companies. And I was really intrigued by that. Went to law school. DC is a great town. It's a great place to go to law school. I was, was in walking distance to the Supreme Court, but I didn't like DC. I wanted to go back to New York. Um, so I went back and had, had a job as a corporate lawyer and did mergers and acquisitions, um, worked with, and that's where I got introduced to venture capital companies, uh, early stage companies and the investors that put the money up for them. 
Um, after a few years, I was looking for something else to do, and I transitioned to the Wall Street area in New York City, where I worked for a small investment banking firm. And over the next 10 or 15 years, we raised about $120 million for a couple dozen small companies, all innovative, all doing new, useful, valuable things. Uh, we would raise money for them uh, privately. We, we would tap high net worth individuals, people with a lot of money. And give, and we'd raise half a million to a million dollars for them, uh, and then we would take them public. Now I don't know if anybody in the call even knows what that means. Uh, I guess I got seniors, juniors, sophomores. If somebody wants to take a flyer and, and put in the message bar there. What does it mean to go public, or what is an IPO? Uh, that's where I spent the, the bulk of my career. Uh, came to Des Moines in '94. Um, now, don't be shy. Somebody put in there what they think IPO stands for, for taking a company public. Or right, let me back up. Let me ask this. Do any of the students own stock or do have any of the students invested in a mutual fund or something like that? I just reiterated your question there. Yeah, Tom. thanks for that. So, Good. You, you type faster and better than me. Because I, I probably will spell so if, if it's silent, that's a no. Um, I'm actually surprised because I've, I've over the years, uh, I've bumped into a lot of young people who have actually owned some, they bought a stock or they have, uh, they own a mutual fund. So well, Emma says, Emma says international public offices as that's a guess. A, that's a good guess. It's not right, but thank you, Emma, for uh, reaching out. So IPO stands for Initial Public offering. And what we would do is that we would interact with companies that had started, they were in business, but they were very young and they needed money to grow. And because they were in business, we knew there was some interest in what they were offering, uh, a new and improved product or service. We would get them some money, as I said, mostly from wealthy people that would get, that would cover them for some months, and then we would raise them between three and five million dollars by taking them public. And what that means is anybody, you, Amy, uh, individual investors could buy a piece of ownership of that company. So the public offering part is uh, pub public individuals and, and businesses could own a piece of these companies. And the, of course, they're making the bet that the companies would grow and become worth more. And the, and the opportunities were driven by the innovation the companies represented and their financial performance. So I mentioned that because the, the business that we're in doesn't even exist anymore. It, it, what we did is too small today. It's too expensive. It's too highly regulated. There are other options, uh, but that particular business doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but there are lots of opportunities even here in Iowa, for people to work in uh, the finance area, raising money for both innovative companies and even established companies. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that if people are interested. So I, I share that background. And then later, much later, uh, after spending a decade and a half in the uh, investment banking business, I uh, shifted over on the teaching side. I still keep my finger in mostly as an investor, which means I, I may buy ownership in a company or lend small amounts of money to a company. Not big. I'm not Warren Buffett uh, or anything like that. But there are opportunities from time to time that are attractive to me. And I still interact with companies on an advisory basis uh, regularly. So, so Tom, what, what, what did you love when you had your hands in the financial world and um, what did you love about that? And what were some of the challenges about that? No, I actually, that's a great question. And it will help bring me back, Amy. Thank you. Um, so if you recall, you know, I mean, I had an opportunity to go to Italy and archaeology camp. I was an American history uh, major, but I ended up studying French, teaching French and, and taking courses in French drama because I liked the professor. As a matter of fact, I just talked to his daughter the other day. She's running the language program at Dartmouth and they've devised a way to use Zoom for live 
language instruction that is innovative. And I'm fascinated by that. So what I got, both as an attorney, um, but especially raising money for these companies is, I worked with really innovative people and I worked with a wide variety of people. I am interested in a lot of things and I am broadly educated. I didn't, as you'll notice, I didn't have a finance background. If you go to law school, you don't get taught finance. Uh, you get very little introduction to, if any, to accounting, which is a critical tool. Uh, there's not a lot of math in the law, although that's changed a little bit. Uh, uh, if you get into the tax side or some of the uh, mergers and acquisition stuff that I did. Um, I just had the ability to learn on the fly and I loved the variety. And I loved it, at my level of investment banking, working with the presidents and senior executives of these companies. Now there are, there are opportunities and the more likely opportunities in central Iowa, Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, and the quads, probably over in the, the west side of the state as well, uh, with some of the regular banks, the banks whose names you might know, Wells Fargo, um, uh, the, the many state banks in Iowa, they often have investment opportunities there. And they, but they're generally, their clients are generally investing in big companies, kind of like what Warren Buffett does. Um, what they look for and, and where you can, and the way to find your way is to have that solid education. These are attractive, high paying, competitive jobs. So they look for bright young people. Frankly, they tend to recruit finance and accounting majors, but the people I know who have prospered in uh, the things like I did, as well as some of the corporate jobs, and I'll talk a little bit about the insurance industry and the banking industry in central Iowa, um, prospered because they were very well educated and I don't mean they went to the best schools. They just were, they, they were educated. They, they learned and they learned how to learn. And I'm still doing that. And that was extraordinarily valuable for me. The other thing that the people I know uh, that's a little bit different than my background is they generally knew a lot about something. And it might have been a pastime. I, I had a, a young student come to me for advice some years ago. And he had been captain of the sailing team, which I didn't even know what that was, but he also had spent time in Russia. He ended up parlaying that into a job for uh, a large commercial bank in New York City in their maritime lending. That was a, a section of the bank that made loans, big loans to shipping companies. Uh, ocean going vessels are huge, they're expensive and they're expensive to operate and they're all all those companies operate with borrowed money. And he turned his personal interest in sailing and a semester in Russia into a career. Um, another young woman's father had been in the oil and gas business and she really liked it. Uh, and she had a background in math and some of the social sciences. And she was able to turn that into an analytical position in the oil and gas industry through, you know, using her network connections, which, which she didn't want to do at first. And I said, they're not going to get you the job, but they'll get you the introduction. So Emma, I'm going to read into your comment, uh, a question about the intersection of law and finance. It is a terrific combination. One of the challenges, um, and, and there's tons of opportunities there and uh, law schools are, are certainly looking for students and they're, you know, the University of Iowa has a nationally ranked law school. Drake has a good law school. Creighton has a pretty good law school. Uh, Minnesota's got a law school, um, all of which can get you going. Um, right now, a traditional legal profession is tough, or a job in the legal profession is tough. The legal profession is undergoing the same kind of contractions everybody else is. But the combination of the two, understanding how the law works, particularly from a regulatory perspective, and understanding how money works is a great combination. So when I advise students, and sometimes they take my advice, about half the time they haven't, they're happy being young lawyers. I, I, I would not advise somebody candidly to, to go after a legal career unless they had a focus, either in a particular area of the law or a combination of law and finance. But a great combination is to, uh, get an undergraduate degree in finance and or accounting 
or in a more maybe supply chain, which is an, another area of logistics, and then couple that with a legal education and then look for opportunities to apply the two in your career path. Law, uh, law degree typically takes three years after college. Uh, and something else I advise young people is a great combination is to look for schools that offer you a law degree and an MBA, a Master's of Business Administration. And there are, Drake does it, I think Iowa does it. Uh, there are schools around and where you can combine the two and instead of spending five years in graduate school, you can knock that off in three or four years, typically four, but some of those schools will allow you to start as a senior in college. So instead of going to college for four years, law school for three years and tacking on another year for a business degree, you can maybe get it all done in seven years, six or seven years. You know, the challenge with going to graduate school these days is it takes you out of the job market. Right now, the job market is terrible. So, so hanging out in professional schools, not a bad idea. The other thing I have found, and I have never regretted my law degree. I liked law school, it was very challenging, um, but it is a great credential. People still value it, even though I have not been a lawyer uh, in 20 years. I continued to practice inside my firm. I helped with a lot of contract and a lot of risk management when I uh, worked in the investment banking business. Um, so it is a great, great credential to have, and it's a great background for the analytical aspects of whether you're, you're raising money or helping other people raise money as bankers do, as commercial lenders do. Um, and accounting Getting accounting under your, bank, under your belt, as Emma shares that she has done, uh, accounting is the one discipline that I believe is essential for anybody looking to pursue a career in finance, lending, banking, insurance. Even lawyers wish they'd had it. My wife is an extremely successful, very highly compensated litigator. In other words, she works in dispute resolution, um, mediations and, and trials litigation for corporate clients. And um, it took her years to be comfortable understanding accounting and understanding the interplay of the accounting. And accounting is the record of the financial performance, both from time to time and over a period of time. And everything in business revolves around those disclosures. Um, so Amy, oh, that's Amy's question. I was going to say, good question, Amy. Uh, so majoring in finance in college, which is a certainly a worthwhile pursuit. It's one of the more demanding academic disciplines in colleges. Uh, it's known for its, you know, the rigorous course load. Uh, it's quantifiable. Um, so there's both methodology and getting the right answer. Um, unlike in history where you, you can kind of argue both sides. Um, the finance majors coming out of Iowa State and Drake for the last four or five years prior to this pandemic, and I think it's held true, but I haven't seen the numbers uh, yet. Um, but at Drake and Iowa State into 2020, finance majors at a 100% employment rate. And they were getting jobs at insurance companies. And insurers basically take our, you know, our money or company's money uh, and offer them protection in the case something goes wrong. So it basically, I'm making the bet that something's going to go wrong and I'm going to get my money back plus plus. It's, it's, it's kind of a weird bet. But um, they also offer retirement products um, and insurers have to invest the money because they need to make a return. And that's another place where people with that finance background and finance majors be, get trained in modeling um, money coming in, money going out, and, and the methodologies behind making decisions about what to spend your money on. So in the central Iowa area, principal financial, um, allied insurance, uh, nationwide insurance, uh, Aviva, which is an international insurance company. Another great place uh, that it recruits, and again, uh, very high success rate with both finance and accounting majors. And I think 100% of accounting majors uh, get employed coming out of the, the Iowa schools. John Deere Credit, 
And we, we all know John Deere for their implements and their beautiful, you know, gigantic, handsome green farm equipment. But John Deere Credit uh, is one of the biggest financial institutions in the Midwest. And it's because if somebody's buying a, a six figure combine or reaper or cultivator, um, it often makes sense for them to borrow the money to do it. And John Deere will, will help them get that money. So it becomes a, a way for John Deere to, to foster more business. And it is, it, it is known for having a great work culture as does principal, as does allied uh, and nationwide. Uh, all of those places, all the insurance companies in Iowa depend heavily on building models of kind of predictive models. And none of them has a crystal ball. They all get it wrong. But that is an area where uh, both finance and accounting majors prosper. The other thing, uh, for those of you who might be math whizzes, um, and I was pretty good at math. In fact, I mean, I was really good at math when I was young. But then I met math geniuses when I got to college and they just smoked me, but I can keep up. Uh, but there's another interesting path to explore and that's actuarial science. And actuarial science is all about monetizing uh, unknown and risk. And the most of the leaders of the successful insurance companies in Iowa, and I, Iowa is if not the leading, and it, it changes from year, it's the first or second uh, most prominent and most established insurance center in the United States. And actuaries tend to go to work for insurance companies where they help the insurance companies build the models against which they sell insurance and manage risk looking forward. Uh, so uh, Vinuthi asks about uh, years to get a finance degree. Uh, you get in the normal course of your college education. And in fact, um, the, all the finance students I know um, get it done in four years, um, and they, they tend to get pretty good internships on the way. And as I said, one of the reasons they get it done in four years is they are looking at very high paying jobs when they get out. Last date I had was from 2018. It hasn't gone down. It may not have gone up, but it hasn't gone down. Finance majors were getting uh, first year salaries around the country um, in the eight or $90,000 a year range. In the central Iowa area, it's probably a little bit lower, but it was still up there with uh, software developers and app developers who, who were start, getting starting salaries in the 75 to $90,000 a year. A uh, young woman I knew uh, mentored at Drake in 2018 uh, ended up uh, connecting with one of the large consulting firms. And consulting firms are often a combination of accounting, uh, financial modeling, and investment decision making. And she connected with them on LinkedIn, by the way. And I encourage all of you, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, set up a LinkedIn profile. And if you send me an invitation, I will accept the invitation. Just remind me that we met in this um, presentation. And because you just never know when our paths may cross again. But uh, this young woman found her job, and I think it was with um, it was either Google or one of the tech companies in Southern California that had an active investing branch. In other words, they were looking for companies to invest in, and they needed somebody with uh, math skills and big data management. Big data is it just what it sounds like. Big numbers, so like the stuff behind Amazon or Google, where they're they're managing millions or billions of interactions, and they want to monetize those things. In other words, they want to turn those into dollars and cents. Um, so uh, it was a variation. It wasn't an axi degree, but it was a, a math intensive degree uh, that led her into this, you know, the the front end of her career. Um, Drake does have a great actuarial science program. Um, it's actually one of the better ones in the country. Um, I, you know, I think Iowa has a, well, I know Iowa State has an actuarial science program because one of my fun friends from Drake came up here to help run it. So Iowa State also offers actuarial science 
probably at the graduate level. I don't know, I don't know how active, I, I'm sorry to say I don't know at the undergraduate level. But that is a highly specialized, uh, it's a license type uh, uh, career path where at the end of your studies, uh, there are certification exams similar to getting a law degree or a medical degree where you have to take uh, licensing exams. Um, but they're certainly available and, and they tend to, to attract people who like math and strategic thinking. Uh, the investment banking career that I pursued uh, has changed a little bit. It's generally now working for larger companies and investment banks get, spend other people's money. It's a kind of a great model, but they spend other people's money, uh, manage other people's money. That could be retirement funds, pension funds, uh, family fortunes, and they help them uh, diversify their uh, investments around uh, different things, ranging from art to lending money. So I don't know if you guys, I'm going to date myself, but David Bowie was a prominent musician when I was coming up, certainly when I was your age, and just passed away a few years ago, but he actually uh, sold to an insurance company the future rights to his uh, music, published music at the time. He basically said, okay, here's my published music. I will sell you the rights to all the money I make on that in the future. And they paid him tens of millions of dollars for those rights. And they did that because they needed something that wasn't like anything else that they owned. That was this notion of diversification. Um, nowadays with crowdfunding, you're seeing musicians and artists offering home concerts, pay what you will. There's a whole new world in the finance area. So those of you who may have some digital chops, maybe you like playing around in the app and computer code world. Uh, there are all kinds of opportunities to figure out how to connect small investors with people who need money. Uh, there's a, an entity called Prosper, which is a way for people to borrow money. It's extremely successful. Uh, there are a number of platforms where small companies can raise money uh, with lots of disclosure and they provide accounting background and they provide modeling and they can raise money on the internet. So there are entry points almost regardless of your background. What I will tell you is that um, a, a good education, doing well in school, all, all the firms I've named are looking for students who get good grades and who are active in their career. But that could be maybe you work full, you know, you work a job and you do well in school. So what I advise students is to get a good broad college education, take advantage of the many things that the schools you, you, you might go to. And that can include community college, by the way. Again, they offer a broad array of things, but take a deep dive on something. Uh, be, develop expertise in a particular area. Going back to the young guy who had sailing and spoke Russian, he didn't intend that as a career, but it launched his finance career. And what it shows when I look at somebody's resume is they do well in school and then they did something that they were passionate about and it sets them apart because there are thousands of finance majors, there are thousands of accounting majors, there are thousands of XI majors and they all look alike on paper. So you have to set yourself apart. And one of the ways to do that is by, maybe it's a dive into music, maybe you're an athlete, uh, maybe you're, you have started a service organization, maybe you're active in your, your uh, church or worship place, uh, maybe you started a, uh, an advocacy group, something that shows that you can apply what you learned in a focused way uh, is very attractive to employers out there. Um, So anyway. Yeah, Tom, we've got one question I think that I'd like to address yet, and then we'll probably sign off. But Vinuthi says, would you agree that finance is a degree that applies no matter what career you choose? Um, well, an undergrad finance degree is a great stepping stone uh, into any career path uh, kind of outside of academia. In other words, with a finance degree, it doesn't set you up if you want to go into uh, an academic area not related to finance. But from a management perspective or a career development perspective, because of the rigor, because it introduces a very, very solid way to 
assess the need for money, the, the costs and benefits of spending money in different ways and, the, and devising strategies around that. It's a great background uh, for business and it is, it is recognized uh, certainly in the workforce as a challenging uh, undergraduate degree. So people who do well in finance are attractive to lots of employers because they have proven they can do hard work and they learn some specific skills. Great question, Vinuthi. Are there any other questions from our audience, from the students? You can either unmute yourself or type them in the chat, but I want to be aware of, of Tom's time and everybody else's time as well. Tom, maybe as they're thinking, um, any particular things that skills that you see that students possess um, that make them successful in a financial career or a career in business? Um, what stands out to you? So in addition to um, ha having a solid base, you know, they're good students with a, a, a solid education. So they are aware of both the, fine, not just financial stuff. I mean, they're aware of social stuff. They're aware of cultural stuff. They are aware of their place and our place in the world. That's extremely important. Um, probably the most important skill, and it is sadly lacking in a lot of folks that we see even in, at, uh, the, the university level where I've spent the last 20 years uh, is uh, good communication skills, particularly good writing skills. S unfortunately, given you know the, the 140 or 280 character limits on things and the, the prominence of text messaging uh, and emojis, which can be a lot of fun if you don't screw them up, and the Lord knows I screw them up all the time, uh, the ability to write clearly and concisely is maybe the the uh, the skill that is most lacking, and I see it in some of the quantify qu quantifiable majors like Axi, like finance, like accounting. And interestingly, some of the best writers I knew coming up, both when I was a lawyer and in my investment banking world, world were the accountants because they could all do the math. Now, every accountant out there can can do the math. They they can set up the accounting. Uh, forms, the accounting principles. But what's important about accounting is all of those come with explanations and those explanations are reviewed very carefully and they have legal sub significance. So sloppy or imprecise written communication could be really adversely expensive. So I will tell all of the students that you should continue to read a lot because all finance uh, careers. I don't care if you're lending against an automobile uh, purchase, which is another great area, by the way, but they all require the ability to read, to read critically, and to communicate in writing, not just text messages, not just uh, tweets or comments on an Instagram page. The ability to communicate clearly in writing. Don't forget your basic composition lessons. Um, There's something that drives people in the in professionals that I've worked with over years that drives them nuts with young people coming in who have a hard time crafting an introductory letter, who have a hard time writing a thank you note uh, in email. Uh, you have to be able to communicate clearly. You have to be able to communicate concisely. I'm sure all of you have tons of messages. Uh, you get them all at your barrage with this stuff. Think about hard, how hard it is to break through. All the successful people you can name, whether it's Warren Buffett, the people running the large banks, the, the, the bankers in your hometown communities, they all can communicate in writing. Speaking of which, and this is the last, last tip I'll offer, if you don't have a bank account, I suggest you get one. Now, I, I have had a bank account since I was 13 or 14 years old because I've been working since I was 13 or 14 years old. I don't put a lot of money in my bank account anymore because I put it in these other investments. But it is very important to establish some relationships with people out there in the world. And, and I would encourage you to, to open up a bank account in your hometown 
uh, at a local bank, and walk in and introduce yourself. Hey, I'd like to open a bank account. I'd like to have a checking account, and I'm going to have a savings account or something like that. Savings account, you don't make any money. It's just, it's just a secure place to store your money. But those people will then be the folks you can go back to when you buy a car, or maybe you're going to buy a house or buy a condo, or you want to go buy a boat and you need some money. Um, and knowing those folks, they are all interested in connecting with young people. And if you don't have any money, um, then you don't open a bank account. But when you get into school, uh, and, I, and I, I think a college degree is critical for opening up most of the doors in the finance world, but there are plenty of people who find their way in through expertise. So you don't have to have that, but making those connections. I go, I shared that those anecdotes at the beginning of connecting with people in Florida, connecting with friends I hadn't seen in 40 years. Um, the ability to build your network now, connect with me, connect with Amy on LinkedIn. Um, I mean, I can tell you right now, you connect with me and we and somehow remind me how we're connected. I can find somebody in every corner of the state of Iowa in every industry in Iowa. I am 100% confident of that. I feel like I know everybody in Iowa, even though I don't, so. Tom, I feel like that is powerful advice. Um, the, thank you for bringing up the communication um, advice. Students, I know you probably hear it from your teachers all the time, but I think it's really important to hear it from other professionals. Um, certainly in the, you know, if you're going to enter into the financial world, um, people want to, if they're going to trust you with their money, um, they certainly expect you to be able to communicate clearly, precisely, and without spelling errors and in a professional manner. Um, if they're going to all of a sudden hand over hundreds of thousands of dollars um, under your care. Um, so thank you for mentioning that, Tom. The networking advice is absolutely imperative as, as you grow up and start entering into college and thinking about career. I couldn't agree more. Um, let your network work for you. Um, and it's not as scary as you think it might be. Um, people are always willing to help. Um, people enjoy talking about what they do. Um, they're passionate about it and they want to see other people be um, successful and have a small hand in that. It's fun to make the connection. Um, so I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and Tom, I don't want to cut us off short here, but I'm, I'm aware of the clock. And I know some of these students are going to join some other sessions that will be starting soon. And I want to be cognizant of your time as well. So um, students, thank you for your questions um, and for your attentiveness. I know it's, it's different to be um, connecting via the chat, but I really appreciate the questions. Tom, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, for your advice. Um, really enjoyed visiting with you and, and getting to know you a little bit today. That was my pleasure. And I, I put my email in the chat there, um, but I would encourage all of you to reach out on LinkedIn. Um, I check it sporadically, but I reply to all the inquiries I get there, and I love connecting with uh, young people, regardless of their uh, career choice. The other thing you can look for on LinkedIn is interest groups. Uh, there are lots of targeted groups on LinkedIn. And one of the things I like about it is it, it's, these are reasoned, reasonable interactions. Uh, it's a safe environment. And just as Amy said, uh, most of us on LinkedIn are very interested in sharing both what we do and sharing our connections with others because you just never know. Uh, and it is a small world. That's all I can tell you. Take advantage of the virtual nature of things nowadays. Most people are much more open to it than they were even six months ago. LinkedIn is a great resource for building connections and starting out and, it, and you are not too young and it is not too soon and it's never too late, ever. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. It was great. Uh, please reach out, guys and gals. If, uh, if, if you have a follow-up question or something, you can run it through me, run it through Amy. I'm, you know, Amy, I'll, let's keep in touch, all right? Will do. I like it. Thanks so much, everybody. So I'm just going to leave.